record. And today we're going to talk about the process of doing a quarterly review and looking at what we're doing, what we have been doing, and, and, and how that can affect what we're going to do in the future. Um, I, I'll, I'll say this. When, when I became a Tom Ferry coach, I thought I knew a lot more than and I realized that I knew. And, and some of the things that, that really helped me um, uh, to, to dig into um, what, what it was that was creating success and what it was that was getting in the way of success um, was a very important part of, of me getting more efficient. And um, as we get started and we look at of view, just here's my background. Um, I've done, I was the number one new agent in Florida. I did 120 million in one year. I've listed over 120 properties in a year, national trainer and coach. I've owned three different brokerages. I've worked with every major brand, uh, former chief operating officer of the real recruiter and Chip Black Solutions and a former Tom Ferry coach. Um, and the purpose of doing a 90 day review is to obviously acknowledge some of the success uh, that we've had in, in our, in our previous quarter um, to look at what were those actual things that, that we did that were good and what were the results that we got that were good. Um, one of the things that, that I have found is that it is very easy for us to ignore numbers um, and go based upon how we feel. Um, and, and this for me is, is, uh, is not the right way to run a business. It's, it's um, you know, I feel good because I was busy this past quarter or, you know, or I feel good because I closed the number of transactions that I said I was gonna close, have very different meanings um, uh, to our pocketbooks. Um, and then ultimately, this is the biggest reason why we do a 90 day review or when we go back and we look at things every 90 days is so that we can make adjustments and create a plan to stay on track or to get on track. And I'm gonna go ahead and silence my phone because I tend to get a bunch of notifications while on the call. So um, the fourth part of this is to assess each lead source. And, and I'll throw this out to you. One of the things that, that I have seen a lot of agents do is we end up pouring time and resources into the things that we think are the most fun or the things that fulfill a, a more primal need for us. I'll give this example to you when it comes to me and my, my life and my business is um, I know that the prospecting that I do and talking to new people on a regular basis is the most important thing in my business. But, I will spend an exorbitant amount of time doing things that get in the way of me doing that. So um, uh, what, what I have found is that by doing this on a quarterly basis, by looking at and analyzing each of my lead sources, looking at where each piece of business is coming from, and then making decisions around how I'm going to invest in my business is an essential part of keeping my business on track or getting it back on track. And I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll use this example. I had an agent um, uh, uh, who, who worked for my company in, in Florida, and, and he, every six to eight weeks, would change directions in his new big thing of what he was going to be doing. So he would say, oh, Chris, I'm going to do for sale by owners. And he'd do for sale by owners for four to six weeks. And then it would be, okay, Chris, I'm going to do expires because I didn't have excess with success was for sale by owners. And then he'd go into expires. And what would happen is he would start 10 different things around 10 different lead sources and not actually assess where the business is coming from and where the good lead sources were. And what would happen is he would start getting business from the for sale by owners that he had started once he was already working on something else. So we're going to dig into how do we assess each of our lead sources and, and get an understanding of, uh, uh, what we should be doing, what we should be doing. And then also um, is it's very easy to get very overwhelmed by um, what should I do? Where should I be focusing my attention? Um, uh, and, and 
you know, digging into these things that I think should be better than they are, as opposed to investing our time and money into things that are going to going to give us the highest return. Um, and I'll, I'll I'll throw this out as the best example I know. Almost every real estate agent I talk to talks about how they need a better website. They need to do more with Facebook, and you know. I, when I talk to them, none of their business comes from Facebook or from websites, but they believe that that's where they need to focus attention because that's the buzz that they're hearing in the industry. Um, so the process of a 90 day review is you need to look at the difference between qualitative and quantitative. So quantitative are things that we can measure. So quantitative data is how many phone calls did I make? Um, uh, how many listings did I take? How many buyers am I working with? Um, you know, what are my average days on market? These types of things, things that we can, we can put a number with. This is, this is quantitative. Qualitative is um, I do a really good listing presentation. Um, my scripting is good. Um, uh, I, 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 ha I, I feel good about what I'm doing. I'm feeling more comfortable with what I'm doing. I'm not saying that qualitative is not important and quantitative is important. I'm saying that we need to understand the difference between them. And for the purpose of a review, we need to be focusing on the quantitative, not just the qualitative. We need to go back through and, and, and look at what our major wins were for the past quarter. What I usually do is, is I take out a few pieces of paper and I do this longhand on like in a journal or a notebook um, talking about, okay, what were my major wins? Um, what were the things that I did better this past quarter? What are the areas where I'm growing? Um, and I take every aspect of my business and rank it on a scale of one to 10. What that does is it gives me an understanding of where I need to be improving. So leading indicators and lagging indicators. So our leading indicators are the prospecting activity that we do. Our lagging indicators are the number of deals that we close, right? Because the phone calls that I make today do not equate to a closing today. What I will say is if you right now in September, tomorrow, October, are not working with a lot of people. You are not working with as many buyers and sellers as you think you should be working with. I can trace it back and look at your prospecting activities in July. And you will see that in July, you were not making enough prospecting phone calls, right? Because our leading indicator is the calls, our lagging indicator are the closings. And so what most of us do is we, we look at our lagging indicators and leading indicators backwards. And what we, what we need to realize is that you need to be prospecting more when you've got three deals in escrow, right? Because you, you, you need to replace that, that, that activity. Um, and that's why the consistency of our prospecting is so important. Um, so also what's important is looking at some comparison. Where am I compared to last year? Um, what is my average price point? Um, I like looking at ratios. So I'll throw this out to you. If you are recording the number of calls that you make, the number of appointments that you go on, the number of listings that you take, looking at those ratios so that you can do things to improve your actual sales efficiency. So um, one, of the, one of the numbers that, that we throw out in Tom Ferry Coaching is that it's 40 real estate conversations equates to one transaction, right? So um, if this is if this is your number, forty real estate trans, trans, conversations equals one transaction. If if these are your your numbers, um, uh, then you know you're on track. If you're having to have fifty or sixty, then maybe our scripting needs to get better, right? If I'm if I'm um, if I'm you know talking to twenty people, you know twenty people this week, and I set two appointments. Um, then maybe I need to look at, okay, what is my call to, 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 to appointment ratio? Um, and if it's not good, then I need to improve the, the, the skill set of the, the phone calls that I'm making. So 
the deep dive that we need to do into each lead source is extremely important. What I would strongly suggest you do is that you take out a piece of paper and you write the name of your lead source at the top of that piece of paper. So sphere and center of influence would be my first one. Um, my next one would be, because obviously we're talking about the core four, my next one would be what is more farming. My next one would be my you know, online leads, my Facebook leads. Um, uh, if you do not have one or two niche lead sources and your business has plateaued, you need to be incorporating some niche lead sources. Um, uh, I'll throw out one uh, that I believe is an amazing new niche lead source that I'm beginning to work. Um, and, and that is, and we've got a training going on next week about this uh, here in Dallas, is, is working with the Airbnb investor. They have different metrics that they're looking at. They have different uh, uh, um, uh, focuses. And um, it is a different conversation with the Airbnb investor. And what I have found is that some homes that I would not be able to consider for my regular flip investors or you know, buy and hold investors, the Airbnb investor or converting a, a buy and hold or a flip investor to an Airbnb investor um, uh, opens up their, 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 their mind to maybe some different properties and some, some different uh, uh, possibilities. Um, so if you're here in the Dallas Fort Worth area, I strongly suggest um, going to the event and I'll put the, the information on it in the uh, Make Money Now uh, a coaching group. Um, some friends of ours are coming up from Houston and they, I think it was like four years ago, they converted all of their rental properties over to Airbnbs. Um, and they're going to be talking about what they did and how they did it and how to work with Airbnb investors. So that as a niche lead source, um, uh, whatever that case, whatever the case may be, I, I I'm coaching a, a an agent. Um, and actually I, she may be on the, she may be on the call today. Um, uh, but she has a special needs daughter and, um, she understands what the, the differences are for someone who has a special needs child when it comes to purchasing a home or selling a home. Um, and so we're, she's going to be creating a Facebook page and a Facebook group. And part of her prospecting is going to be to uh, families with, with special needs children because she understands the differences uh, that they have when it comes to what they need for their, uh, for their real estate. So in our deep dive for each of our lead sources, and I would do this independently for each lead source separately, is first looking at, and this is our lagging indicator, how many pending or closed transactions in this last quarter? What was the gross revenue? What were my expenses specifically in these lead sources? I'll throw this out to you when you look at the ratio between your gross revenue and expenses, it's going to tell you where you need to be investing more money. Because if you have a lead source where you're investing, you know, a thousand dollars for the quarter, but you got back 15,000, it means you need to be investing more money into that lead source compared to going after the lead source where, okay, I got 4,000 back on a thousand dollar investment, right? You want to look at those areas where you have, the, the, the best ratios and invest more there. Obviously, we're going to evaluate our leading and lagging indicators, which, which we talked about. Um, so the initial measurement matrix. So what, what we want to be looking at within, within this matrix is, is where are we um, uh, investing our time when it comes to the, the um, when it comes to proportion. So, and I'll throw this out to you. So if, if I have a farm area of 400 homes and I am spending two hours a day on my farm area um, and I want to add another farm area so that I can scale, uh, what are those, what are those startup costs, both in time and, and money that I'm going to need to invest uh, and for how long in order for that to be effective? Here's what I see a lot of us do is what we'll do is say, Oh, okay, well, Yes, you know, I went to a training on farming, so I want to now farm 5,000 homes. Um, but that's really expensive because, you know, 5,000 homes, if I'm spending, you know, a dollar a month, you know, on a, on a mail piece, that's $5,000 a month on this, uh, you know, on farming these 5,000 homes. And so what we try to do is, is get back to let's start small 
and then scale as opposed to as opposed to not being able to do all the things that we need to do because we we bite off more than we can chew we don't have the time to actually deal with that so um, one of the things to look at within the lead source is if you're not getting the success that you need in that lead source is it a problem with the lead source or is it a problem with you um, many times I have looked at um, and I'll use this as an example. I know a lot of people who work expireds and I don't like working expireds. I just don't, it's not my thing. And, and, and so I've gone back and forth. I've worked expireds, you know, at times, and I think I've got a really good strategy on expireds. I'm good on the phone with expireds, but it's just a beating talking to 30 or 40 people a day that don't want to talk to you. I'd rather talk to 30 or 40 people a day that do want to talk to me. And so for me, that is not a good lead source, right? It's just, it's never worked out that way. You know, who knows, you know, as, as economies change and things change, we go back to other lead sources. But if you're not getting the results that you want, is it an issue of, of the source is not uh, providing you with the results or is the problem you and your application? Um, and then looking into, as we're, as we're evaluating each of these leads, lead sources, what is really needed in order for them to get into maximum efficiency? Um, am, I, am I allowing for enough time to elapse for this to be successful? That's, that for me is one of the most important ones. If you are farming, and I believe that our sphere of influence, our center of influence, and our farm should be our two major uh, uh, lead sources, is the consistency that's required to farm effectively is much more important than the intensity. I'll repeat that. Consistency is much more important than intensity. So I'll throw this out to you. An apple a day keeps the doctor away, but seven apples on Sunday will get me sick. Right? So I sit here and I look, so I need to, you know, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. And so I want to eat an apple every day. I get to Sunday and realize that I haven't eaten any apples. So I sit down with a bag of apples and just eat tons of apples and, and, and I'm sick to my stomach for two days. Right? So I want us to, to use that when it comes to our lead sources. So if I'm applying time to a lead source or resources to a lead source, uh, once a day for 15 minutes or a half an hour, um, or am I catching up and doing it for two hours on Sundays, right? Or three hours on Mondays. And so um, uh, if you're not sure as you're evaluating this, am I doing the right things? Am I applying the right resources? The, the, the next piece of this is, is we all need to have objective opinions. Um, and, Sometimes like I'll, I'll begin saying something and I realize how stupid it is just because I'm saying it out loud. Um, but then other times I need my friends to tell me and my colleagues in the industry and my mentors and my coaches to tell me, you know what, Chris, that's just sheer insanity. Um, that has not worked the previous 500 times you've tried to slam your head into a concrete wall. What makes you think the thousand and first time is going to work any better, right? but I don't have that objectivity sometimes around my own business and I need that objectivity from, uh, uh, from the people around me. So P and L analysis, I'll ask this question and ask you if you know how to raise your hand in, uh, in zoom, um, who has done a P and L analysis in the last month? If you've got your picture, you can just raise your hand physically and I'll see you. Uh, 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 uh. So who has done a P&L analysis in the last three months? All right, beautiful. Um, who has done a P&L analysis in the last six months? I was, yeah, right. Okay, so, so here's what I would say. If you've done it in the last three months, but not in the last two months, start getting in the habit of doing it at least once a quarter. And if you're somebody who is doing a P analysis daily, don't allow yourself to look at it 
for the next 90 days. Because we've got two different types of people in my experience. Those of us who will look at our P&Ls daily and, and freak out. And those of us who will never look at our P&L. The other thing that I will say is that you are too subjective to do this alone. You are incapable of accurately walking yourself through your P&L. You need someone, whether that's your, someone in your upline, whether that's you know, your, your broker, whether that's your coach, whether that's your accountant, you need someone else looking at these numbers for you to help you understand. Because when somebody who isn't you sees online leads as a line item, and, it, and they see that you spent $17,000 on online leads in the past three months, and they see that you know you, from that lead source, you've only gotten uh, you know one sale in the past three months, they're gonna say, hey, wait a second, what's going on with this? That's way too much money. And you say, oh, well, you know what? It takes you know three to six months in order for that to build up. We need to look at that again in six months, right? To see what are my leading, my lagging indicators on that. So like I said, we either do this too much or we don't do it at all. Um, I go I go in phases. There are times when my my you know I am just so you know focused on on my PL and other times when I don't want to look at it. Um, and I would venture to say that the best way to track and analyze your success of your business is not in how many closings. It's not in gross revenue. It's in how much more money do you have today in savings or in investments than you did three months ago or six months ago. And, and, and I'll throw this out to you. I have the amazing ability to spend 120% of what I make. I'm, I'm, br I'm brilliant at it. Um, I, you know, and, and I've talked about how, you know, I did 120 million in a year oh, and I'll, <laughs> glad to say yep yep so you know I did 120 million in a year I spent I you know at that time I was spending um you know 30 and 40 thousand dollars a month on making a team go right you know and so I so there wasn't as much profit there as what it looked like the most profitable I have been at times uh and and when I was doing the best yeah really Bruce only 120 right uh when I've done the best um is is not when I've had the highest uh, uh, number of transactions, but when I've been operating the most efficiently. So, um, uh, yes, I think it's important that we look at things based upon how many transactions we're doing, but ultimately we need to look at it from the perspective of what is the net benefit to us? Are we netting more long-term money, not disposable money, but long-term money? Are we netting more time? I, I mean, I'll throw this out and be team. And I have talked about this a lot. You know, you know, how has my time been? Have I had more time with my family? Have I had more time uh, to do the things that I want to do this past quarter? Um, and that is something that, it, that, that we can definitely look at to, 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 to evaluate. Um, how has your passive income grown? For those of us that are, that are, that are uh, uh, EX peers, after this call um, uh, at, and, and, and at, 1035. So we're switching things up a little bit. So we're going to go five minute break and then do the, the, the talent attraction call. But how, how have your activities caused your passive income to grow? If you're not an EXP -er, then this is, these are things like, you know, rental properties and things like this dividends that you're receiving from investments, because ultimately that's the bottom line is, you know, do we have more money invested? Do we have more savings or do we have passive income growth? I would venture to say, that making more money, but spending more money on your car payment, your house payment, your vacations, isn't, you're living a little bit better, but it's not necessarily making you more money long-term. Here is, I would say, my biggest question to those of you who feel as if you're plateauing and why p &L analysis is important. You're probably not spending enough in the areas of your business where you're getting a good return on investment. Um, and and um, as you go in and you're digging in and looking at the, the numbers around your business, um, if you have a lead source 
that uh, um, that is performing well, you need to find ways to spend more money in that lead source to, 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 to bring back more. And, and this is one of the most important reasons why we need to have systems in place so that we can scale them, right? Because uh, we have, if we have a system, then all I need to do is, is, is add more resource, be it technology, human, or financial, and my output will grow as well. Um, it is insane that most of us don't know what our margin numbers are. So if I were to ask you, uh, you know, what are your profit margins on a particular lead source? Most of us don't know. We, we evaluate our lead sources by saying, uh, okay, so, you know, I get all of my business from referrals and, you know, I got, you know, you know, this business last year from these friends that called, um, and, and we don't have a, a way of knowing what are my, what are my margins for each of my lead sources, right? So we look at it all at one, um, and we don't know what our profit margin is. Um, and if we don't know what our profit margin is, my guess is we're probably not turning a profit, but basically just living on what we're making paycheck to paycheck. Um, uh, the, 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 the biggest month I ever had in real estate was over a million dollars. I spent over a million dollars that month as well. Right. So, I mean, in the net net of it, it was the same as if I had done a $5,000 month and saved $5,000, I would have come out higher than doing the million and, and spending the million, if that makes sense. So what needs to change? This for me is the most important part of your review. Once we've done all of that and looked at the facts, we need to look at what behaviors or, di or disciplines do we need to strengthen or create? What, what, what are the things that I'm doing well? What are the things that I'm not doing well? Um, what skills do you need to improve? Wow. You know what, Chris, I, you know, I go on lots of listing appointments, but I don't, you know, I don't, you know, close any listings. And then, you know, if you're going through this process with a coach or with somebody who's, who's helping you, they're going to ask you questions like, great. So tell me about your pre-listing package. My what? Your pre-listing package. So what's your budget for your pre-listing? Oh, I don't do a pre-listing package. I just go in and talk off the fly. Well, if, if that's, if that's what you're doing and you're not getting, closing all those listing appointments, you might want to reevaluate, right? Um, if, if, if you're, if you've got this amazing listing presentation and you've got a great pre-listing presentation and you know, you've got all these, you know, really beautiful marketing pieces and you're not getting the listings, but you're going on listing appointments, then maybe it's what you're saying in your follow-up, right? Um, and what I, what I think is that I need the, the, the opinion of someone else in order to really evaluate these things. Next, what work do you need to do on your personal psychology? Um, on a daily basis and on a weekly basis and on a monthly basis, I have motivation at the wrong time. I'll wake up at five o'clock in the morning and think today I'm going to make 50 phone calls and I'm going to talk to people. And by the time nine o'clock rolls around, I am totally out of motivation for making phone calls. Right. I'll go away on a retreat. I was away this past weekend on, on, on a retreat Saturday morning with no cell phone service and no internet. I was more motivated than I've ever been to pick up the phone and call people. Right. Cause I couldn't do it. So what do I need to do when it comes to my personal psychology that's going to help me be in the right frame of mind to be able to do the things that I need to do? Um, and what's next? So here's what I'll th I, I would throw out to you is you need to review these findings with a coach. If you don't have a coach, get one. Um, if you can't afford a coach, you really need one. Um, uh, and, and, and I, and I would throw this out as a bridging the gap type of thing is, is if you are not being coached, if you do, do not have a coach, reach out to someone 
within your organization, someone that you know that can stop gap and get you to the, to the place where you're making enough money so that you can afford a coach. Um, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's really interesting that the, uh, uh, when we were in Tom Ferry coaching, the, the, the mid-level coaching, which was the elite coaching where you're coached for half an hour, um, you know, every week was about $1,200 a month. Those people had a, a, a three times higher growth rate in their business than those that were spending $600 a month. Is that, is that interesting? So it was, it was, that was the proportion. So being coached led to bigger growth. Review these findings with the coach. They're going to see things that you don't see, and they're going to help you see through your BS. Um, next is you need to create accountability. I would guarantee you that there are two or three things that you are not doing in your business that you need to do, that either you don't want to do, or they don't get done, or there's reluctance, there's not discipline, they are not habits. You need to create accountability in order to get those things done. Um, I ask every coaching client I have the same question. Are you more motivated by positive rewards or negative punishments? And everyone, oh, it's $13.99. Well, well, good. I'm glad it went up. So um, everyone always says, oh, carrots. You put a carrot out in front of me and that motivates me. Bull crap. If you think that, you need pain, right? So pain is what motivates most of us. We say, I'm motivated by rewards, but in reality, I'm motivated by pain. If you are in a relationship, I want you to think about the thing that's going to piss your wife off or husband off the most, and that should be your penalty for not achieving your goals, right? So what, what is it about your mate? So I had, a, I, had a, I had a buddy who has just, he just couldn't stand it when his wife went to the spa. He was like, I can't stand it. She goes to the spa. She spends two or $3,000 with her girlfriends. You know, why do you need paraffin on your knees? You know, and just going to like have apoplexy about this, right? And so what we did is we set things up so that if he did not hit certain goals on it, he would, you know, send his wife to the spa, right? Or go even, go, even worse, go with his wife to the spa, which made him almost, you know, want to have a nervous breakdown, right? So, but those are the types of things that really motivate us to get things done. Um, create some accountability, create some real accountability. Account the good accountability is the accountability that makes sure you get the stuff done that you don't want to do. And I'll throw this out. A solitary self-appraisal is always insufficient. A solitary self-appraisal is always insufficient. If I look at my numbers and I look at my performance just by myself, I'm not saying it's not going to be good, but I'm saying that it's going to be insufficient. It's not going to be good enough. Um, so I'll throw this out. We've got a few coaches on the call. I don't coach for, 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 you know, I coach people within our group and things like that. I can help you get started in this, but, uh, whoops, there we go. So there's only one person who is incompetent at being your coach. That's you, right? Your wife will do a better job. Your five-year-old kid will do a better job. Siri will do a better job. Siri, should I make phone calls today? Yes, Chris, right? You know, it's, it's, it's really that simple. So you're the only person who's incompetent at being your coach. Get into a relationship of accountability. It doesn't need to be formal. I think formal works better for most of us. Um, but get into a relationship with someone who has an interest um, in, in, in helping you perform and helping you perform at a high level. Um, if you need help finding a coach or getting hooked up with somebody or whatever, feel free to text me or call me, um, 972-338-0763. Um, for those of you that have my other number, you can use that number too. Both numbers work. Um, I've gone over by five minutes, which means we're going to stop now. We're going to take a five minute break and come back for the, uh, talent attraction coaching call mastermind. Um, it's the same link. I look forward to seeing all of you here. We're going to talk about these same things when it comes to uh, um, uh, um, a 90-day um, uh, review within our talent attraction. All right, guys. Let's see here. More. Whoops. Thank you.